so I, uh, I'm going to talk about a project um, that follows on some initial um, work that I've done, um, basically looking at how science is often done in communities of innovators and how to bridge uh, the knowledge flows between communities. So let me just present to you how um, I understand that we normally think about uh, policy levers and innovation. And here I want to take sort of a, a broader view. Um, a lot of my talk is not going to engage directly with patents, although I hope to in the future. Uh, but I want to start from um, looking at all the different policy levers we have um, for innovation. Um, I'm going to actually, this talk will be mainly about grants, but again, um, I want to bring up patents um, later on. So, so when we think about um, how to um, stimulate innovation, right, we think about two goals that we have um, for this policy, two, two potential things that we're trying um, to solve and correct, right? So one of the things is that we want to identify those innovations that if we don't do something, right, the market is not going to give us on its own, um, which could be, um, we could say that we want to identify those innovations that but for the policy lever, they would be significantly delayed, right? So sorry, we significantly delayed in society. And then a second lever, um, which we don't talk about as much, but I think is implicit, is that, well, ideally, we will want to uh, incentivize innovations that have high social impact. So um, <coughs> that's more clearly what happens with grants and with patents. The ideal quadrant you want to be is where the private uh, value actually matches up with high social value, right? So then you, the, you're incentivizing high social value um, innovation. Uh, and we have you know, four major policy levers to do this. Uh, and we normally think about grants as doing this through incentivizing long-term socially beneficial activities, usually requiring a huge amount of money, like you know, building some, uh, uh, building a huge um, infrastructure, or doing something that will require an enormous investment up front to lead to um, to lead to um, a product which uh, wouldn't be efficiently incentivized by the IP system, right? So long-term socially beneficial activities for which there's no significant market demand, so private actors are not going to invest in it. Um, and then patents, we think about patents as um, they tend to, we want patents to prevent free writing by copies who do not invest in research and develop. So this is just, I'm just telling you a traditional uh, way in which we normally look at the role of grants and patents in identifying innovation. Okay. Okay. So basically, what's the thesis of, of my presentation? Um, I am arguing that when we think about these incentives, we're making an assumption in the background. And that assumption is that it assumes that the actors who are doing the innovation have available the knowledge necessary to invent so long as we can fix the free writing and market demand uh, problems. Um, but actually, we are ignoring an important problem is coming up with the knowledge to make innovation, which is the architecture of knowledge distribution. Now, what do I mean by the architecture of knowledge distribution? So I'm borrowing this from um, network theory. Um, it starts with the simple insight that um, science and innovation in general happens in communities of practice that um, could be, um, is it laser pointer? Um, it happens, so science is normally um, happens in communities of practice, which could be um, diagrammed as different nodes in a network that have lots of connectivity among them. What does that mean to be part of a community of practice? It generally means that you share a particular training, you share a certain number of assumptions about how you view the world, a certain number of assumptions about what's a legitimate or most more important research question, and about what are the right tools to answer a particular question. Um, what we might call ordinary science, one of my interviewees called it ordinary science, um, although many important discoveries can be made, is science that happens within that community of practice, right? Um, and what, ha what I talk about, what I, what I mean by the architecture of knowledge distributions is that often those communities, even though they often have complementary information that is put together would lead to important innovations, those communities often don't talk to each other, uh, and they have what uh, uh, social scientists call a structural hole in between the two. Um, and um, often hap what often happens, so there's a lot of this in the management literature also. So the idea of a broker. The idea of a broker is the idea of a person or a, or a particular um, 
institution that is placed in a very strategic part of the network so that they have access to two communities of practice. And there's a fair amount of literature suggesting that if you have that position in the network, you have more of a chance to be thought of as a creative individual because you're actually bringing ideas from two different um, pools. Um, so, um, so basically, the gist of my thesis is that if we're thinking about innovation, and this is one way in which innovation happens, we should think about how to incentivize what I'm calling scaffolding, the scaffolding of the connections between those two groups. Um, and why, in particular, might this be important is because there's several research that suggest that innovations with high social impact are those that are particularly at that intersection. Um, so you have um, a paper by B. Fleming suggested um, that scientific research that assembles novel combinations of previous work is more innovative than more conventional research. The problem is often that novel combinations are less likely to be taken up by other researchers. This makes a lot of sense if you think about diffusion tends to happen more within the network of your community and you have something that's in between, it takes, it's harder for it to diffuse. Um, and this is something that actually talking to the scientists who actually do the work is recognized. So it's not just something that you have from <coughs> studied networks and patent citations, um, but if you look at, um, and this is a, a statement by Greg Farmer, which is one of the, um, is an NIH officer, um, and he's paraphrasing what Elias Sarhuni, who was a former um, director of the NIH, said in 2007. In biomedical research, we picked a lot of the low-hanging fruit, and the problems that are left are difficult, and they are difficult principally because they're getting they're going to require multiple disciplines to attack them simultaneously and developing a common language is really very hard. Okay. Um, so what are my, so this is a sort of a long-term research process. So I want to present you with my research goals and questions, my theoretical framework, and then some qualitative data. So overall research goal is to focus on trying to identify how these policy levers in the form of patents and other incentive systems, ex ante grants, exposed prices, or tax incentives, can support useful scientific communication, break down barriers, and help reduce multidisciplinary inventions. And these are my more specific research questions. So, when and how does the architecture of knowledge distribution erect barriers to knowledge acquisition? How could we design policy instruments such as patents and grants to bridge the structural barriers to innovation? How effective are short-term grants, um, ex ante incentives to actually, so, so one idea would be, do you need a grant to continue, or is this networks are fluid, so if you have a, a, a shock to the system, a grant that's like five years, is that enough to sort of get the people talking to each other, and then you can get rid of the, of the money? Um, and, and the last question, which is potentially more controversial, and I would love to talk about it more, I'm not going to engage with it that much, could patents have a structural function? So our patents, uh, is a, sub a specific subset of patents which actually um, basically is bridging together, it has uh, two or more collaborators from different disciplines. Do those patents actually play a structural role to foster continued collaboration, right? Or are patents bad in this space, right? So what role do patents have in fostering scaffolding? Um, okay, so what, what is sort of my, my theoretical framework for thinking about scaffolding? The reason I'm calling it scaffolding is because my idea is that um, if we're worried about the architecture of knowledge distribution, what we ideally want to do is to create temporary bridges across communities of practice that help seed and diffuse collaboration, often creating new communities of practice at the intersection. Um, and I am, as I'm thinking about this process, I think there's three kinds of ways in which you could think, three kind of kinds of access in which you could think scaffolding would work. One of them will be generative scaffolding, you know, which will be as a catalyst for bringing together disparate communities in the beginning. So grants might, might, might have to, so if I'm right that patents potentially serve a scaffolding function, you still need to have those researchers get together in the first place, right? So you need something to get the, the groups together. Then there may be maintenance scaffolding, and that's where I'm thinking that patents may play a role. Like once the groups are, uh, are working together, how is that maintained? What are the elements that need to maintain that collaboration? Communities of practice have a strong gravitational pull. Um, and then another type of scaffolding will be translational scaffolding, scaffolding. The idea that we don't just worry about different communities of practice in the, in the basic sciences. I'm thinking about from basic to clinical, right? So temporal, how do we bridge the the, um, the practices in a temporal side in terms of if you think about 
um, research timeline. Okay, so how am I um, approaching this? Um, I'm going to tell you about a qualitative study that I've been doing. Um, and so in 2007, the NIH had this um, idea under Sir Hooney. Every NIH director has a pot of money that they can sort of decide how to use. And, and Sir Hooney decided he was going to have a grant. It was going to be a fair amount of money. And what that grant was going to do is ask people, scientists, to come up with a question who, that could only be addressed by teams of different disciplines. And then he's going to fund a bunch of these. This was unique and interesting. There's nothing like that in the NIH now. So it was unique and it was short-lived because Francis Collins decided he wanted to focus on the genome project, right? So it was a short-lived um, grant that created a whole bunch of consortium. Um, and so I, my ambitious plan would be to at least look at three. Uh, but I started by looking at the Oncofertility Consortium for the simple reason that it's at Northwestern, so they made it easier to, to talk to people. Uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm, there are only eight consortiums, so I, I'm planning to talk to, uh, to talk to all of them. Okay, so what did I do? Um, I did a series of semi-structured interviews with principal investigators, grant administrators, and other key informants, and I've done 12 interviews so far. I um, attended one annual conference. I'm planning to attend another one, and I've reviewed all conference presentations and panels. Um, and this are, and I know I don't have a lot of time. How much time do I have left? Ten minutes. Okay. Um, okay, so the Oncofertility Consortia is interesting, um, and I'll tell you in a minute exactly what the Oncofertility Consortia is, but as a, as a, in, in principle, in terms of understanding the barriers, it was, it's a consortium in which uh, there, was a lot, there was a lot of resistance from communities working together, right? So if you have the, the remarks from, the, from Teresa <coughs> Woodruff, who is the principal PI on this grant, she said two years ago, we were barely able to get any traction on the idea, but now every clinical practice we talk to is not just interested, but committed to the concept of harmful fertility. So I'm interested in figuring out, okay, what were the barriers to multidisciplinarity? How did the transition from resistance to acceptance take place? Did a new community of practice and a new discipline emerge? If so, how, um, if not how, has collaboration continued? How did the grant help? Did the grant help? Would it have happened without the grant? What is the role of patents in your collaboration? Are the patents hindering health and collaboration? How do you use patents? And what happened when the grant ended? Um, okay, so let me just introduce you to uh, what oncofertility is. Oncofertility is the idea that um, when uh, you're treating cancer patients, as survival rates have increased, um, there's a lag in the, the, the fertility options um, that are available for women, right? So there, there's a gap in that, you know, the cancer doctors are basically saying, eh, we're just gonna kill the cancer and we'll worry about that later, but later you were infertile. So when the women went to see the endocrinologist, they wouldn't have kids. So the idea was, well, there's a gap in trying to understand the toxicity of the drugs and the gap in trying to understand how can we preserve female fertility. Uh, and this actually happened before egg freezing. So at the time, there was even, there was even more of a gap, right? Like you couldn't, now the gap has, has uh, closed. And it was a particular gap for women, not necessarily for, for men. Okay, so what were the communities that were involved here? On the medical side, oncologists and reproductive endocrinologists. So most medical oncologists didn't discuss threats to fertility, in particular with female patients, and there were no long-term studies on the study of, on, on this drug to, to uh, cancer treatment of female fertility. And the reproductive endocrinologists didn't routinely treat cancer patients, and they didn't do research on the chemotherapeutic effect of drugs on fertility. Okay, so I'm just, what, so this is in, in, in a sort of anthropological mode. What I have next um, is a series, so what I did was I, I interviewed, they were semi-structured, and then what I did was I went and I coded the interviews based on themes and based on things that I was looking for. So here are my um, results from the, from the interviews. So what, what were the barriers to collaboration? So I've come up with two um, interesting barriers that match how we understand communities of practice. So one of them is just research priorities, right? So I find that in our area, the oncologists are a little bit resistant to participating in studies such as these. It's not really high in their list of priorities. So oncologists is way not interested. Um, my colleagues in oncology, they're so busy and there's so much dealing with living and dying issues. Talking about fertility preservation is not in their agenda. I don't think it's first and foremost in their minds. And it's also about entrenched practice styles, like how oncologists were trained to do oncology and to talk to their patients. Um, 
so for example, uh, one of the, the interviewees was talking about all of the biases that oncologists had when dealing with, with women. Um, and so they say, don't worry about the esoteric stuff, she can't afford it, don't even bring it up. Uh, to my favorite, uh, adoption is always an option, which we knew from our research was not the case. But it had all of these biases that came from the fact that they hadn't recalibrated their thinking um, to the fact that these were diseases that killed people in the last generation, but they don't now, right? Um, and again, the idea that the, the, the oncology was just worried about li living and dying, they had certain ways of doing their oncology treatment, and there was no room for uh, fertility. The same was actually happening in the, in, in, in the endocrinology side. So most IVF clinics um, have a consumer-driven type of care. People who go to those clinics are very educated and have a ton of time. They didn't have time to include people who maybe had to have fertility preservation tomorrow because they had to start their cancer treatment. Uh, okay. So then the next one, so how, how did, how, what, how did you, you get these two communities to talk to each other? Um, and what was the role of the grant? Okay, so one thing that perhaps is not surprising um, is that a key element in this was to have a high status intellectual actor that organized the collaboration. Um, so a lot of the interviews um, came up with this idea that the main person, Teresa, had a particular characteristics that, uh, that made her the ideal leader. She was trustworthy, she was open, and she was pushy. So a lot of, of it, at least that Penn had to do with how much Teresa pushed, and really kind of Teresa were pushing in the right way to get this to be a more recognizable path. Um, Teresa thought really, really big, and we've got all of this other unrelated science fields involved, and which actually are related. I'm going fast, I want to make sure that I have enough time to finish. Okay, so um, a couple of uh, interesting findings that I've had in terms of figuring out uh, why people would get buy-in into this, this program, right? Why, why did people actually end up collaborating? One of them was, Teresa was very persuasive. The other one was, of course, the grant. They were able to get the money. But another thing that, that happened, and that it made this program continue after the grant, which was surprising to me, was the emotional reward uh, in working at an intersection of two fields. So to a, to a person, every single scientist that I talked to, talked about how this experience was transformative and that it was the best science they had ever done. And that was because, so that was because they were working at the intersection. So it's an irony in that it's difficult to, 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 uh, to do teamwork, but there's something about teamwork across disciplines that energizes people. It was really interesting because these were people with a ton of experience in science, right? So um, one person said it was one of the best efforts I've been involved with in terms of science. It was easily the best program that I was involved in 40 years of research. It included reproductive biologists, matrix bioengineers, cryobiologists, top of the line clinical scientists, and Richard um, Stauffer has been working in science for, for more than 40 years. Um, Dr. Teresa Woodruff talks about um, this is what science should be, this is where catalytic science could be. Uh, and Mary Zielinski, again, very, very seasoned uh, researchers. Then you get to this consortium where you have access to all of these people in different areas to pitch into this common good and to share just data, to share fear, to share successes. It was just the most rewarding experience I've had in science so far. Okay. I think, you know what, I'm gonna, I, this is the problem. I've never experimented with putting these whole lines of text and it takes too long to get to them. So let me go to my last um, slide and make one last uh, point. Uh, so, so, okay, so, so I, ha I have a lot of other findings as to whether the grant helped, whether the grant didn't help. In this case, new social networks were absolutely created by the grant. One huge hurdle was actually the NIH itself. This grant required NIH institutes to work together, and that was a disaster. Um, so then, what, what are my next steps? So my, my next steps are, well, I want to look at other consortia, these still key elements for a successful collaboration, um, and, and propose ways in which we would have ex-ante incentives to support these collaborations in the forms of grants, and maybe how to, t how to de design grants better than this particular NIH grant was designed, and then to turn to patents, to patent serve as scaffolding, um, a scaffolding function. I'll end there. Yes, so I'm just sort of curious, like, what is your thoughts on how patents would do the scaffolding? Innovation because to a certain extent it seems to me like it's all brought together. Um, that's sort of a result, right? That could come out, and and I'm sort of 
I just was sort of thinking yeah. if you've got theories more on um, yeah. how that would work. So I start, like I tell you my first theory on that how my thinking has um, evolved. So at first I thought, well, um, and the reason why I'm not sure my first theory is right, I want to be more open. They may have a negative or a positive effect, right? So positing the patent scaffold innovation, I'm sort of assuming that they might, right? If I find that they don't, what does that mean? But let me just tell you, the, so why do I think patents might scaffold innovation? The idea is basically creating um, social contacts, right? So why might co-authoring with somebody, right, cement your, uh, your relationship with that person? You are working with that person towards a goal, um, right. That has, that is successful, right. and that's and that motivates you to continue working at that intersection, and it might motivate other people. So both both the, the people collaborating at first, and then sending a signal to the field that is a productive. But why? Marriage. Can't, I mean, like it, it just seems like an odd. I don't know if I would say it's the yeah, it would be a scientific journal or a sign. You know, like what is it about patents that would be sort of unique or sort of different than? Oh, right, so I'm not saying, so what I'm trying to say here is that this is an interesting potential new role of patents, right, that, of a subset of patents that hasn't been described. So what if, and this is a hypothesis, and I'm, I'm, I'm collaborating with a network theorist to see if it's plausible, plausible, right? But what if there's a subset, there's a subset of patents that we, that's very likely that are more valuable than others, right? There's some, yeah. we have some evidence, a subset of patents that are very likely that, yeah. that are more valuable. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a question, right? It's, it's not at the exclusion of other stuff. Like certainly, scientific papers do that potentially as well, right? But what if this is an additional role of patents? If you have, especially in the industry, right, where there may not be that much much cooperation, if you're if you have a successful patent between two groups, does that foster you to keep on collaborating? Yeah. Yes. Let me suggest an answer to Melissa's question that you might want to investigate awesome, yeah. or think about. Um, so, so. You know, it's great to be empirical and theoretical and whatever. But some at some point, you need to be doctrinal. Um, so suppose you suppose you start looking at, for example, inventorship requirements for patents, and you ask the question: Okay, does the fact that to be a, a joint inventor you have to contribute to the conception of at least one claim, right? Is that the sort of thing that will create the, the network node that you're talking about, or do we need to change that? You know? So that that might be the kind of yeah. doctrinal. Uh, so looking at the inquiry that you might make. Yeah. 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 So I think I'm out of time though, right? So I'll take one more question. Yes. Oh, did you already answer? No, I mean I think it was a great. That was a that was a, that was a great suggestion. I want to talk to you uh, more about that. And I was just thinking that one way that we were going to um, address the the network part. Well, you know what? Let me. I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Let me just. Yeah. Let me just take one last question and then. So how do you see the role of creating new patents versus combining two existing patents in the three fields? Do you see them as um, working together or so when you say combining like more collaboration when I say right. combining two patents in their existing patents and two communities? Right. And you pull them together. Right, so that made things tricky because, so that's in a way my, my reasoning was evolved to okay, patents could be a hurdle to collaboration if you have the traditional problem of uh, the anti commons, right? What if you have a ton of patents in one community, a ton of patents in the other community, and then in order to collaborate, you need to cross license and combine patents, right? So potentially patents could be, but if you get the cross licensing, right, and, and you're combining patents, and then you get a new patent in that initial field, that will fall off my. Theory, that, that new patent would potentially start as a scaffold. Thank you very much.